Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be within your presence. I appreciate, and I do, I had set out a prayer and offering for Allison for her health and recovery and for her well-being. I know she has a lot of words of wisdom that I myself hold uh, dear to my heart and to my teachings as well. Um, I grew up in a Pueblo way, and I was fortunate to have grandparents who were very mindful, and they taught me about mindfulness in gardening and in um, actually participating in our rituals, um, and also washing dishes, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought at that time was ridiculous, but now I look back and I thought, wow, that was mindfulness. That was mindfulness of actually be in the present moment when you're picking an herb or you're making a medicinal tincture and, or even uh, when there was a disagreement you know with my siblings and I still use that today with my siblings but just pulling back and holding back. I wanted to talk to you a little about for those of you not familiar about the teachings of the Buddha because this is how I blend those teachings with Native American. You know, when I went into CDL, and well, actually, when I went on my first retreat, I didn't really want to go, and it was with Joseph Goldstein. And I kept throwing away the announcement, and finally they said, you're invited, we'll pay for everything. And I, and I finally thought, okay, I'll look at it. And when I looked at it, I thought, I could probably use a vacation. I need seven days, and silence, I guess, is not bad. But boy, I tell you, those seven days were the most painful. And in fact, it was that first retreat was my honeymoon. And on the fourth day, I wanted to divorce my husband. <laughs> because all these stories were made up. And I just sat and sat. I thought, well, I better just give it a try. And so I sat through it. And I realized the stories were coming from myself, coming from the deep sense of fear. And where was that coming from? You know, who is myself? Who am I? And so that really joined things together. The same thing being initiated as a Native healer. I didn't want to take on the responsibility of that. In fact, I thought, well, gosh, they're so old, they're not even going to remember what they said, and I don't think they know what they're talking about. <laughs> so, you know, because the responsibility of a Native healer means 24-7, uh, and even at nighttime having to be in the presence um, F as to what is. And um, that I don't wish upon anyone to carry on the responsibility of that because that is a livelihood. That is the livelihood for the, till the days to come. So the Buddha is a man. And I wanted to know who this Buddha was. You know, what's so great about him? You know, in my lineage, we have many people that are very great with great wisdom. But I really wanted to know the characteristic of this man. And why are people following him? Why are people to this day coming with these words of wisdom? Well, he was a man that was, you know, born 500 B.C. I mean, that was way a long time ago. Way a long time ago. And really, he wasn't really respected in his early years. Nobody really knew him. And it probably wasn't until his later years in life, in his 40s, which was late in the, at that time, that people started following his teachings. And then more so after his death. What he left behind was mindfulness, was the essence they call it the flower of essence. Being very mindful at the time, at the moment. After sitting under the Bodhi tree, you know, getting insight in various, various exercises, getting insights, that happens. It's like, yeah, okay, that does happen. We do that in our own tradition. We go on fast, we go on pilgrimage, we go on, you know, on the dances. That does happen, okay, so everybody has that. But when I really looked at the teachings, really in depth, of the Buddha, it makes sense. 
And the great foundation that I think everybody should know are the noble truths. And the noble truths are calling about four things. That life means suffering. Life is suffering. You are born into a being to have suffering occur. And I'll go more in depth to that. The origin, the origin of suffering is attachment. Yes, we're grateful. But even that gratefulness can have attachment to it. If you say a prayer, that prayer can have an attachment to it. It's a wanting. It's a wanting of gain. I'll go a little bit more into that. But the Buddha said that all suffering is attainable. That we can obtain and overcome this suffering. And that there is a pathway to our daily livelihood to end suffering. As long as we know the in-depth of our actions. And I like that last one. Because it gives me hope. It's like, oh, okay, suffering doesn't last that long. But I like that last one because when I took on the medicine ways, and thinking back to my grandparents' way of living, it's like, oh, okay. It makes sense. Right livelihood. Right actions. Right speech. Those all come together on every single moment in time. So, when we go into life means there's suffering. This whole world. The moment you took your first breath, or even before that, when you were coming out, that was the most suffering of all. Right? Do you remember that? I mean, you got to because all this light, all this sound, all this sensation, it was the most horrendous suffering of all. So in the native way, that's why we realize that and we make sure that the baby is cared for for at least three months. And the first offering we give the child is to the sun. Literally, to the sun. And we introduce the baby to the sun and give it a name at that time, when the sun is rising. Because we want that being to be in a relationship of what is. To have that inner strength in that core. What you're born with, what your ancestors have in you. Because we know you're going to be having challenges for the rest of your life. You're going to be encountering things by learning and gaining wisdom. So we mark these in our lives for transitional life patterns. And we have ceremonies for that. Birth, when you're coming of age, adulthood, and then as an elder. So we mark these because those are transitionings you're coming into. We have that already on a yearly event, our solstice and equinox. So if you take this for three months in sections and knowing, okay, this is a transitioning part of time. April. Rebirth. But that also means rebirth in the mind. What can you really look at that you have been suffering with in the winter time? that you've been idling with, and give it rebirth and allowing it to come forward to fruition. You have the planets, you have the grandmother moon, you have the sun, to really be there, to be there as a witness. And that's a good time to just throw out your suffering. This is what ha I've been bothered with. We did a practice this morning about breathing in, breathing out. And that is the main practice that Buddha gave. It's just to be in the mindfulness state. Just the breath. Just the step. Just the walk. Just the drinking of water. Just the swallowing. Just the chewing. Just the movement. You're gifted so many opportunities throughout the day to be mindful. But in our society, we tend to overcome, we overlook that. We strive for so much. We walk ahead of ourselves. We, we plan. We want. 
we desire. So when I went to the prison, the detention center at Little Pueblo, I have to tell, be honest with you. I told my supervisor, I said, I'll come out here to help you all. And, you know, when you get a job, you have to be fingerprinted and all that. Well, the fingerprinting happened to happen in the detention center. I was frightened. I was scared. And I went to my, the, the lady there, and I said, I'm going to tell you one thing. I'll work with kids. That's fine. I love that. I'll work with the elders. But do not send me to the detention center, please. Well, what was the first grant I wrote? <laughs> Detention Center. <laughs> it got funded, and I had to go to the de Detention Center. So it was both teaching back and forth. I mean, yes, and so when being in the moment, I watched my breath, I watched my fear, I watched, you know, just myself in that one sitting. Yes, one eye was open and one eye was closed at that sitting, first sitting. But I come to learn to know and myself through them. And they themselves too. Because we all are suffering. And it came back to these teachings. We're all suffering. Every single one of us suffer. And if we keep that in mind of knowing, then we're able to have compassion and wisdom for all. The truth and cause of suffering. Well, there's so many things to the cause of suffering. You know, are wanting coffee in the morning. And what if we didn't have coffee in the morning? <laughs> Supper. <laughs> <laughs> well, my body suffered too. Not only my mind, but my body. <laughs> and, you know, the temperature. Even our bed, pillow, suffering. We're taking a shower, suffering. There's a practice I take uh, every year, and it's a sun dance. And my late husband introduced me to it, Dr. Irvin Lewis, who uh, my dear colleague and dear friend, Ralph Steele knows, who helped us through the transition of his life. He introduced me to Sundance, and I said, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're going to the Sundance. Who are you anyway? I mean, are you a new age person? I mean, this isn't our lineage. Certainly not your lineage. You're half Japanese and half Navajo. He went one year without me. The second year, I thought, oh, I better go. Oh my gosh, who am I? So I went, it's like, yeah, okay, it's hot. Chiggers, oh my gosh, everywhere. I never had chiggers. We don't have chiggers here. But go to South Dakota, you'll get them. <laughs> it was so hot, 112 degrees. They're dancing nonstop for three hours on, and as a participant to help another, you're there dancing with them, but outside on the arbor. At least I was able to eat. They're not. At least I was able to drink water by going far away. They're not. But that was the moment when I saw the deep vision that there is no separation. That we all carry our sufferings together. And I saw in the sky this chief. I thought, oh gosh. What did I eat? <laughs> what hallucinations are I having? And this was right before I was initiated, so I didn't know anything about all these hallucinations. <laughs> but I saw this chief coming through, and all these beings of different nationalities coming, and they all understood one another. We all understood each other's suffering at the various levels, because we were all beings. So, yes, he passed away with cancer, and I had to help him finish his responsibility, and I've been going for the past 18 years, uh, no, it's 12 years, 
to do the with Sundance right now. And we'll be leaving in July. Sundance is something because you really look at your cravings. First day. Boy, I can smell the food from afar. Oh my gosh. Craving and wanting to drink water. You're not allowed water for four days. No food. But you know what my biggest fear? Was shoes. I mean, people are used to pedicures, right? Manicures and all this stuff. But shoes was one thing. And to walk barefoot in thorns, it's like, whoa. And then you wear a simple dress, and I thought, okay, well, I'll make it long sleeves. I'll make sure my sash is covering my eyes so the sun doesn't get in it, and forget it. You don't realize it, because you're almost near death at the third day, second day, third day. Third day, you're finally realizing, what am I, what is my purpose here? And you start to connect with all beings. The suffering. The suffering of children you don't even know of. They <laughs> can't speak for themselves. That are trying to gain wisdom some way or somehow. The elders that are taking their last breath, or those taking their last breath, or those that are challenged with physical or mental or spiritual difficulties and challenges. Or even the trees and the earth that are trying to gain its strength by the top soil and knowing that we as beings, consciously or unconsciously, let go of a paper cup, let go of dishwater that is toxic, or a laundry soap that is toxic, you know, you start to feel this really deeply inside and knowing where is the center of our core? Where is the center of our well-being and where is our mindfulness coming from? Where is my mindfulness coming from to maintain each step? So I maintain the drumbeat, the drumbeat of our hearts, the drumbeat of the core, the center of earth. The drumbeats of the thunder beams that the spiders and beetles and ants all hear. Fourth day comes and we're all invited. However, there's a strong teaching at the end after all has been done by our leaders. And what's the main teaching? It's this. Yes, you're going out there, but always look at your cravings, look at your desires. Look at your wants and look at your needs. Understand your passion so that you don't go from one end to the other. It can lead you into trouble. Look at the clinging. You've missed your relatives, you missed your food, you missed the water. But really be mindful of the cleaningness that you observe in yourself and that you are going to observe as you get out into the world. Yes, you may want your bed. Yes, you may want that cup of water. Yes, you may want that shower and bath. Or brush your teeth, because we can't do that or wash your hair. But remember, every single one of those things that you do on a daily life has some sort of attachments, has some sort of desire and passion. If you just let that go, and if you see that, that would be fulfilling. That is mindfulness. Sidney Bull was asked, the role of a chief as one whose first thought must be of others, one whose job is to make peace, to be generous. When the Lakota leader, Sidney Bull, was asked by a white reporter why his people loved and respected him, Sitting Bull replied by asking it was not true that among white people a man is respected because he has many horses or many houses. Isn't that right? When the reporter replied, yeah, that's truly indeed. Sitting Bull then said, well, that his people respected him because nothing is kept for himself. 
And that's it. You know, I took this journey as a healer. And every single day is giving, giving, giving. However, there's the opposite. It's receiving and it comes to a full circle. So when you're here, receive, receive, receive the abundance of all nature. Receive the abundance of, uh, of a handshake, of gratitude. So there is the end of suffering. And how can you do that? Just have deep concentration. Be very mindful. And knowing that things are impermanent, this too shall pass. That really helps when I'm under the suffering myself. This too shall pass. When I'm in the depths of the suffering, these past two years, I've lost six people in my life that are very, very close to me, that were the root of a home. And that made me go even deeper into the sitting practice. To understand that things are permanent. To understand that there are lessons and I can gain wisdoms from them. The last is to really understand, and what I said what I really uh, like, is that everything comes together. That there is the end of suffering. You can have the end of suffering. And this is what I taught the prisoners, but this is what I really taught, went back home, because this is how we live, on the reservation. Always have a right view. You know, I can hear my grandfather say that, grandmothers. What is your view? Whether it's politics, whether it's helping this earth, this world. What is your view? And then, what are your intentions? You have to have a view first. And then what are your intentions to follow that? Really be clear of your intentions. Is it out of wanting? Is it out of needing or cleaning or desire? After you have those intentions, then you can then take it out into the world. So the Sundance, we're cultivating. What are our intentions? What are our intentions? What are our intentions? Because we can't speak either. We can't speak. We can't look at each other's eyes. Because that's a soul door. <coughs> right speech, right actions, right livelihood. And then once you have that, then you know you got, you're coming it all together to right effort. <coughs> Putting enough effort in, and you see if it's half there or is it fully there. I always check myself when I'm answering a phone call. Am I fully <coughs> there to listen or I'm not? Right mindfulness, and then right concentration. Come, somebody coming in the door. Am I fully there? Am I fully concentrate here and receive? I'm already thinking. Am I fully there to take a shower? To have the water fill my body? Or am I thinking of something else? So that is the livelihood of what the Buddha gave us. And it's very simple, but yet, as a seven-day retreat, on the fourth day I wanted to leave. Because it brought up a lot of fear. It brought a lot of doubt. But it was a fear of commitment. And knowing that just one time, fear of commitment, it really helped me in the commitment of this practice, commitment as being a mother, commitment in my job, commitment in my actions and my mind. So I get the sign that we need to end, um, and any questions we can take out um, in our sessions uh, with each of you, because we have so many well leaders here to help you out in this practice. And I'll be heading up the one in healing. So thank you for your time, and I hope that you really enjoy your day.